Indeed. Well, to know that uh, y'all are doing well. Uh, a few days yeah. ago, I was uh, I was proud to learn that the Texas Public Policy Foundation released a recovery plan, which of course uh, focuses rightly so on health care and health care reform. And I was hoping you could take uh, the audience through some of those reforms and really bring us up to speed as to what we're hoping to achieve over the next uh, several months and years ahead. Well, before I get into that, I think it's important to, to ask a question. Sure. We're, what we're seeing now is, is rhetoric from our, our political leaders saying um, that we need to release or suspend or remove regulations so that we can make it more efficient and effective for medical professionals to take care of patients. The question I have is, if that's good for a pandemic crisis that we have today, why isn't it good for every other time? The issues that we have in healthcare is that we have too many middlemen, too many people that are restricting that doctor-patient relationship. So it's, a, it's very sad that we're in the position that we're in um, that has caused us to realize that government is, is more of a problem than a solution. The solution is giving access to patients. The solution is giving the medical professionals the, uh, the resources and the ability to take care of people as opposed to the administrative uh, requirements that are placed upon them. But as far, but as, far as the agenda is concerned, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a play to increase uh, some of the things that are already good, like telemedicine. Uh, it's, it's always best, you know, as we're trying to maintain the social distancing, we want to uh, make sure that we can get care from home. We want to make, be able to get care from wherever it is that we might be. And uh, it, it's important that uh, doctors, regardless of where they may be, be able to address uh, those needs. And it's not just um, uh, an interaction with your physician. It could be an interaction with your therapist. It could be an interaction with uh, physical therapy or any kind of, of medical professional. These, there is some amount of, uh, of uh, contribution that can be positive for, pa for patients when done in, in a manner such as the one we're using right now, James. Uh, so That's just me jumping online with my doctor or my nurse talking about my problems. They can even uh, prescribe medications. Is that right? That's exactly right. And there, there are a lot of organizations that already provide that service. It's no secret to anybody who's watching that I am a big proponent of direct primary care. Most of my interactions with my direct primary care physician are, are uh, telemedicine based, whether it's text, email, or some kind of uh, two-way video chat, such as this one. And so what's the impediment there? Is it Congress? Is it the Texas legislature? Is it both? Uh, it's a little bit of all because one of, one of the impediments, uh, for example, is the fact that um, in order to, to practice medicine, you have to, be, you have, to have a, a license in the state in which you're practicing. Uh, and so one of the things that has been uh, implemented by the administration is that there's national reciprocity. Uh, another issue is that not all platforms are HIPAA compliant. So they've suspended uh, HIPAA so that people can co contact their medical professional by text, by FaceTime, uh, by telephone. Uh, there are no restrictions or hindrances allowing them to get the information that they need because in the state of emergency, uh, information is of the essence, and timely information is very important. Yeah, uh, absolutely agreed. Um, and, and real quickly, in addition to increasing telemedicine uh, options, you know, I know the recovery agenda lists out a few other bullet points. I just want to go over those real quickly for the folks at home who might be interested in what we're doing. And, and so, you know, the, the very first one that I see on the list is eliminate regulation for public health and safety. Can you expand upon that? What, what regulations in particular are we talking about? Well, as I mentioned, uh, the, the restriction on allowing physicians to be able to practice medicine across state lines, the suspension of HIPAA rules, uh, the ability for um, uh, fast-tracking uh, uh, physicians and nurses to be able to get licensure in, in various states. We want to be able to, to eliminate a lot of the bottlenecks that allow the frontline uh, uh, workers to be able to get to work and see our patients. Mm -hmm. uh, those are... Those those are real issues. Uh, we, we were talking about personal protection equipment. Uh, the federal government right now, you have uh, the president that's invoking um, uh, the Production Act, and then you have Democrats that are saying that we need to federalize uh, 
the, uh, the supply chain. Mm. The supply chain has been an issue, not because of, uh, of, of market forces, but because government has created so many uh, restrictions and so many guardrails that it's, it's really enabled and enriched uh, a lot of those industries like the pharmacy benefit managers, the group purchasing organizations. Uh, they have an exemption from the anti-kickback statute that allows them to participate in, in, in kickbacks, which is absolutely ridiculous. And we, we've had, because of that, we've had sole source uh, contracts and it's created uh, bottlenecks that have resulted in, in a limited supply of equipment that our healthcare workers need. And so I want to go back to that one point about kickbacks real quick, because I think that's a, a really interesting thing that most people don't know. So, so who's getting kickbacks and why? Well, the way it works is this. So most people know what a PBM is, a pharmacy benefit manager. That's, that's basically the middleman. There are three companies that make up 85% of the market or roundabout there. They have either been bought or have bought insurance companies in the last three to four years. Uh, and when those have been very public. And so they use this rebating um, uh, structure where they will go to manufacturers and they'll say, uh, we, we need an increased percentage of the list price rebated back to the insurance company of which they take fees. And so because of that rebating structure, which let's just call them kickbacks because that's what they are, it has created an increase in the list price that has... Um, uh, been uh, put out there by the manufacturers. Um, now, are we saying the manufacturers are, are uh, held harmless from this? No, absolutely. There have been a lot of bad actors, but the real problem that has been driving up the cost of, of medications and on the inpatient side with the group purchasing organizations, we have a real issue with the, the increase in normal supplies that we've been having in hospitals for a very long time. And as, as you remember, James, I was a hospital CEO for 20, mm -hmm. 20 years and you know, there's no reason why we should see uh, have manipulation in the supply chain or in supply and demand for normal saline, which is just salt water or basic yeah. medications that have been off patent for for decades, and then have them increase uh, in in cost because of the bottlenecks that are being artificially created in the supply chain. Yeah, I think that's pretty outrageous, and I think most folks would agree. Uh, let me ask you one quick question on, on this, uh, this area of elim eliminating regulation. So if you had a magic wand and you were able to tell either Congress or the Texas legislature to a regulation uh, to improve our current circumstance, what would that be? The one regulation? You know, I, I would increase it to two. We're, we're working right now with the federal government, uh, with the administration and the leadership of Congress to, to talk about two things. Uh, and they really are hand in glove. And my belief is that uh, the introduction of, of these two things will be transformative for the healthcare industry. Uh, the first is the codification of the president's transparency executive order that shows the real prices of services. People wanna know what the real prices are. Uh, surprise billing is a, fa is a function of not knowing uh, what the price is of a service that you're gonna use. So just like every other uh, good or service that we use, we need to be able to see what the price is. Yeah. It's, it's secret in healthcare. So that's one, the, the, the transparency. On the other side of the coin, it's uh, improving the HSA rules and the implementation of Senate Bill 3112. Uh, it protects direct primary care and it also increases uh, the, the HSA benefits to such a degree that your employer can contribute to it. Your friends and family can contribute to it. Charitable organizations can contribute to it. Uh, governments can contribute to it. And it's important that uh, a system like that is in place so that people can be consumers again. We don't have, we don't have a consumer uh, driven market in healthcare, which is another reason why costs have increased more and more. For the folks who may not know at home, can you give a real quick 30 second elevator pitch as to what direct primary care is and why it's important? Direct primary care, well, and if I can back up, let me talk about what I believe and, and here at the center, what we believe is the basic building block of healthcare. The basic building block is, is that relationship between doctor and patient. Uh, the, the reason healthcare has become so inefficient, so expensive, so uh, uh, unaffordable uh, 
it, it's because there's so many middlemen. There's so many people that have intruded within that, that relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my, I'll just share my experience. A direct primary care is a membership model. It's not concierge medicine, which a lot of people try to say that that's what it is. It's, it's, uh, it's actually uh, more for the blue collar worker. And it tends to be used more so by those that have chronic disease because they need to be able to see the doctor more so than they can with traditional insurance. So uh, you, you pay anywhere between 60 and $75 a month. Uh, it's age rated and uh, you get 24 seven access to your physician. And you go in, you have a visit, and you can visit as many times as you want. But it, it tends to be that you know your doctor at that point, and they know you, that uh, most of the interactions then become uh, telephonic or electronic. And I think that kind of pairs nicely with one of the other reforms that I saw on the recovery agenda, and that's request a Medicaid waiver to increase health care options. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Right. You know, it's been interesting. Uh, I've been a long time believer that healthcare is personal. It should not be partisan. What we're seeing now is unfortunately, uh, people are using this as an opportunity to make a political statement and saying that Medicaid expansion is needed in a time like this. Uh, I, I disagree and I disagree for, for this purpose. Um, Medicaid is, is strained. And the, the, those that are most vulnerable, children, women, elderly, um, they're, they're not getting access and care that they need, for which this, the program was intended. And in fact, in Texas alone, we have over 500,000 people who are eligible for Medicaid who are not enrolled. And many of them, you know, based on, on my, my personal experience, uh, they just don't have the value there. Um, in some cases they do, but in a lot of cases they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to get to a physician and then a specialist and the medication that they need uh, is, is really a burden. The, the amount of adherence is, is very low in Medicaid. So what we'd like to do is be able to give uh, those that want it a, a card, just like in the SNAP program, mm -hmm. where you can go to a grocery store and grocery stores don't tend to be in network or out of network. You can just go to the grocery store and get this, the, the goods that you need. Being able to do the same thing with Medicaid and expand it to pr uh, providers that uh, don't want to deal with Medicaid and they just want a cash payment. Um, we, we believe that that, that will open um, up the amount of people that will care for these patients and uh, will bring down the cost of, of health care uh, as well. Well, extremely important, especially in today's times where people are losing their jobs and businesses are, you know, up in the air. Uh, and real quickly, I want to get to the to the last bullet here. Allow physicians to dispense and deliver medication. I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about this one. So if you could uh, help me get a grasp on that. Certainly. You know, Texas is one of, I believe it's four or five states in the country that does not allow physicians to uh, sell medications out of their own office. And so if you go, if you're sick and you go to the doctor and the doctor gives you a prescription, you then have to go to a pharmacy or coordinate with your insurance company for them to mail order your medications. There's an extra step there, which you want to use your, your, your pharmacy and not all physicians will want to use this, but this, uh, this uh, uh, law, if implemented in Texas, would allow physicians to sell medications at the point of care. It's a safe practice based on research and it, it is shown to increase the amount of adherence by those that need to take their medications because the medications have been so expensive that people will forego them uh, because they have to buy groceries and pay rent. Uh, physicians that are paying, is it, well, let me get to this. The physicians that are selling uh, medications out of their office don't have to use these, these supply chains I mentioned earlier. They don't typically use the PBMs because it's cash. They're buying wholesale and they're selling them. And, and oftentimes they're pennies a pill. So we're eliminating uh, a bottleneck and we're giving patients the potential for saving a lot of money at the point of care. So it seems like this would be something that benefits the elderly and the low income in particular. Why isn't the left, uh, you know, kind of jumping on this bandwagon? I, I don't know. Uh, I can't. I can't speak for them. I think uh, a lot of them, their their heart is in the right place. They care about people, but uh, it, it's uh, sometimes politics gets in the way of of uh, what we want to accomplish. I, I I tell people, regardless of their political uh, ideologies that look, we all want the same thing. We just have different ways of getting there. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, 
uh, people on both left and right focus on health insurance. But I can't say enough that health insurance is not health care. No. Health insurance is the way that we pay for health care. And we've conflated those two and we've confused those two. And we need to focus on getting people care. We need to focus on getting people uh, access to a physician, access to a medical professional, access to a therapist, access to affordable medications. Just because they have an insurance card in their pocket or their wallet, that does not assure them the ability to see somebody that they need to see. Mm -hmm. So we've got to get away from this rhetoric of insurance is healthcare. Yeah, and in, in fact, uh, you and I engaged in a little bit of this weekend with uh, some folks uh, on the other side who, who think just that, you know, if we expand Medicaid, then the coronavirus crisis is effectively solved when, when I don't think that's necessarily true. Yeah, nor do I. Uh, well, let's, let's leave it there with, re with respect to the recovery agenda. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Or are you working on anything else? Well, we're working on, uh, we're working in conjunction with a number of other states uh, that we're excited about uh, uh, releasing our, our, our joint venture and, and helping them and, and supporting them in their healthcare efforts. And uh, our presence in, in D.C. has become uh, more and more substantive, uh, but we're excited about what we're going to do in Texas. And we believe that the recovery agenda is going to be something that will help Texans every, every day. And uh, it's just a matter of, of getting, uh, some of these things through and passed and uh, getting the lawmakers to understand that uh, we want to focus on the doctor-patient relationship. Excellent. Well, I think we're going to have fertile ground come this next legislative session to do a lot of really dynamic things in the healthcare field. So I look forward to watching you and all of your success. Uh, for those who may have some questions that I didn't ask, I want to invite you to uh, go to TPPF's Facebook page and ask away. David and I, mostly David, We'll uh, do our best to answer and field any and all questions, even the mean ones. So uh, fire away where you will. And for those who are looking for our recovery agenda, you can find that document on texaspolicy.com. Just go to texaspolicy.com and search for recovery agenda. It'll pop right up. David, did you have a newsletter that you, you guys are, are starting? We did. We started uh, last month, and I appreciate you bringing that up. If uh, the audience will go to uh, texaspolicy.com backslash ROH for right on healthcare, texaspolicy.com slash ROH, and you'll get uh, our information. You can subscribe to our newsletter, and we do like feedback, um, good, bad, and, and indifferent. Mean ones, we, we even read those, and, and that's okay. You know, sometimes we learn from those because we know that some people just don't intend on being mean all the time. They're passionate, and... Um, you know, they care. Uh, I hope that's the way I try to interpret it anyway. Uh, and well, and we, want to, we want to be able to learn and, and uh, understand where people are coming from. Don't always agree, but it's always good to hear uh, the feedback. It is. And I'll, I'll be honest, uh, the mean comments are my favorite comments. So uh, <laughs> with that, we'll leave it there. And uh, I hope everyone learned a little something from TPPS healthcare expert, David Balot, appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.